So hello everybody, uh, very welcome to this uh, interesting session, uh, Promoting Diversity for a Shared Global Humanity. What a title and what a panel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have speakers from all around the world. Uh, we also have someone saying hi. Hi, Ashtan. We are still missing one speaker, but we are ready to start anyhow, because we're sure that Adam will arrive soon. So the subject is pretty wide and wild, I would say. Um, because we start from the idea that uh, minorities are increasingly protected by law. This is what the, the panel session said. Uh, but still, we probably should ask ourselves, what is a minority? And what does it mean to be a minority? What does uh, being discriminated look and feel like? And then the other question that the panel session asks is, what is being done to alleviate this? No? Uh, and I think that uh, with our speakers, we agree on the idea that we should also think about what we're missing out because of discrimination. And how can we address this never ending waste of resources at the source? And finally, the, the panel session is about how to, how to spearhead intersectionality as a way to understand different worldviews, how to work across cultural boundaries. And what I think we all agree on is that diversity is, first of all, richness. It's the way through which Mother Nature innovates and makes life sustainable. So how and why are we not valuing it? And this is my question for the, this amazingly diverse panel that we have today. So my question for you is, what shape has diversity taken in your life and experience? And why are you so passionate about this subject? So I will start asking this question to Munir Kuzami, who's the president and co-founder of the Swiss Arab Network and is based in Switzerland. Munir? Thank you very much, Ricarda, uh, for giving me the floor. Just wanted to expand maybe one or two um, points about myself. So as you mentioned, I'm um, president and co-founder of Swiss Arab Network, an international NGO, building bridges between Switzerland and the Arab world. But I'm also trustee of the Responsible Finance Investment Foundations, where we act as a catalyst to link together and promote convergence of responsible and Islamic finance. So think about refugee education or unbanked people, how to include them. So I studied business and management, NGO, as well as finance in Switzerland and strategy and innovation at Side Business School at Oxford University. So why I'm passionate about that subject, the topic is very broad, but we are still facing too many walls and not enough bridges. In some areas, we increased awareness, such as gender diversity, think women empowerment, education, think LGBT, or race diversity, think Black Lives Matter. Again, we are still facing too many walls. However, I want to draw the attention and uh, share two personal stories on diversity aspects uh, like age and culture and physical ability. So my father left Morocco at age 16 in the middle of the 60s and worked his entire life in, in Europe, mainly in Switzerland. Since he retired, he feels in Switzerland not used anymore, left behind, depressed. However, when he visits his hometown, Casablanca, he feels like a rock star. So people want to learn from his experience, invite him for dinner and ask him for advice. I, I suddenly see a totally different man in front of me. Think about it. Why is this the case? Why are we treating our most senior and experienced citizens like this? mainly in the West. And the other aspect, 15 years ago, back in university, we organized as part of the largest student-run university chapter of Isaac, a conference around diversity. At the time, the term inclusion was not yet in, in vogue. So we invited a professor on the subject who was um, chairing a center from a neighboring university. 
Back then, due diligence with Google was much uh, less uh, used, and we had a preparation call. When the professor arrived, I saw a man in the wheelchair, and shortly afterwards, I discovered that he was also blind. So I never forget standing with my colleague and totally over, overwhelmed with my emotions and not knowing how to eat and, and really talk to him. So luckily, my colleague was cool and just treated him like anyone else. For me, on one side, it shows what walls I was facing in, in myself and needed to overcome. And on the other side, I was thankful for my female colleague looking at gender diversity who knew how to deal with that situation. So, yeah, just two stories to illustrate how much more bridges we, we need to build in terms of diversity inclusion. So, Ricarda, back to you. Thanks. Thank you, Munir. I think this is a very interesting opening to the fact that uh, uh, one characteristic of diversity is that if you frame it differently, something that uh, can look like a problem in one place can become precious and asset in another place. And it's just a matter of framing, as you mentioned about your father. It's an amazing story. So I would now ask uh, Amelia Lopez-Huit, General partner, partner of MCI Partners, to continue on this conversation. Thank you. Yes, so more than a passionate, I became an advocate, a very strong advocate for gender equality 18 years ago when I became a mother. And uh, that's my personal journey goes together with the global consulting group that I created in 2009 uh, in order to resolve the issue that I myself experienced. And due to the vision that I had myself as a mother, I wanted to bring myself my own solution to the world. And I'm going to, it's a matter, uh, I think the diversity issue in, in my case is uh, representing the gender diversity issue. It's a matter of narrative, as you say, no? It's like when we frame it as a minority issue. And uh, I, I am, all, I will, I'm always in shock because uh, in relation to gender, it doesn't matter the nationality and the sexual orientation related to gender. Females are half of the population. Uh, females are half of the social and economic potential of any country. And most of people around the world, so the human capital that we have around the world, is born from females. So... Um, there is a change of narrative of understanding that we are not tackling a minority issue. We are tackling a majority issue and a systemic issue that thanks, I see a huge opportunity with the sustainable development agenda on what you mentioned before, that gender equality is a global risk, is a country risk, is a competitive risk and as well. But now we are dealing with a market transformation onto seeing that this participation, this it's not a minority participation, it's not a minority performance, it's not a minority problem. And resolving this bridge uh, towards understanding what women and the female capital uh, that we understand in all countries, and it's not only about women, we are talking about, as uh, my previous colleague was talking about, we have to see at the different levels of seniority and intersectionality. We are talking about girls and their gaps in education and access to uh, resources and develop their capital. What countries are so worried about, about the future of demographic dividends? Okay, not only the, the male side of it, but girls today, access to education. When we go to another level of the female capital that countries and companies and all economies are missing. Women, access to the right health, access to opportunities in the labor market. For example, a country like the Netherlands who really neglects a problem in gender equality. The Western countries really have a problem in ignoring that this is not happening in the third world countries. This is happening everywhere. The Netherlands, uh, you see a 50-50% representation in education, for example. The gap does not really happen in education, but women represent only the 30% of the GDP and the labor market. So here you have really a neglection and a lack of opportunity and market orientation, lack of approach to resolve this issue. And so uh, you see this orientation. My personal story goes as I was born in a very small village, uh, a, a girl, and I became a professional swimmer. And in the 1992, I was an Olympian swimmer 
And uh, uh, I have never experienced because of my gender a lack of empowerment. And then later on, I became an IT engineer, having been the global IT managing director for uh, an American multinational. When the gap happened is when I gave birth for the first time. When I was, I experienced on myself the motherhood penalty. The motherhood penalty can be experienced from the maternity care and from this visibility and this participation as a girl and as a woman. I was put back on the, on the glass, on this bridge, facing on that my next role for my next years until the end of my life would be taking care of my children and nothing else. Well, my promise to myself and to my children, I'm a mother of four girls today, uh, is that being a mother was not going to be the last thing I was going to do for sure. Being the mother of my children is going to be the first of many. And I became, in 2010, an expert in gender macroeconomics. I've been working at the UN Women at the International Labor Office. And lately, I'm now the facilitation, uh, the, the facilitation partner of the UN Global Compact Program on Target Gender Equality for uh, multinationals to really create this impact on mainstreaming gender equality from the top, from the leadership. And it's uh, fundamental that companies and all the stakeholders here, also governments, understand that we are in relation to gender as well. We are not, we have to understand that the markets are becoming more fluid. As the World Economics Forum saying, and I'm ending, is we are uh, entering in a new market fluidity. Women are no more a cost and a small niche group. Women are a market opportunity, a social potential that needs to be untapped. And that can be uh, measured in many, many levels, especially in the social impact, the human capital impact for every country. And companies really need to address uh, as solutions to really make a strategic approach to the market to see women not a, not a component of the diversity and inclusion experience. We need to see the investment, the return in financial and non-financial performance and to expand the participation of women as employees, as customers, as and as a supply chain in order to mainstream the maximization of impact of this value chain that can really give this value impact that is key for this shared humanity, a redistribution of wealth, that for that certainly, certainly is going to empower going to not only these women, but the communities and the families that are being sustained by these mothers all over the world. The, the world. So that's my my perspective, and I hope that diversity can make a shift on this multi capitalization of the female uh, power. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amelia. I think that uh, you open a very interesting uh, approach, like uh, how vocal can we be, should we be in, uh, in advocating and showing what is being missed, what is really happening, how big this is, how big, how complex. Uh, you right, rightfully said, I mean, one minority is women, but what about the fact that women are 50% of the world population and 51% in some countries? So how can, how can women be a minority? What is the problem there? And how, how urgent is this issue? How much should we, more should we be pushing for its solution? So these are, I think, are very interesting open matters. And how responsible are we towards our own children about this? So let me, on this, let me open the floor to Ebru Ilan, Ilan, Ilan? <laughs> a director of Kite Insights. Thank you. Hi, yes, um, so really great um, takeoff to the discussion. And Amelia, I, I completely agree with, um, all the issues you've raised, I think that to build on those points, I have to say the the question Ricardo asked is whether whether you know we have a passion for diversity. I think at the moment, when I think about diversity, I feel equal parts angry and hopeful. I feel angry because I know that um, this past year and a half has shown us the true cost of diversity. Um, it's it is women, yes, but it is diversity of all kinds that uh, we depended on uh, to uh, help take care of what, what we found are essential things, care work um, in particular. And we saw this disproportionate burden that people have lifted off of uh, our society and economy's shoulders. Um, and those very people were the worst affected by the pandemic. 
Uh, in some cases, 90% of informal sector workers in South Asia um, and in Africa, in parts of Africa, have um, you know, faced incredible job insecurity. It's true for um, right on our doorsteps as well. So that makes me angry. It also makes me angry to think that we had already pay gaps when you think about diversity. And in the US, it's gonna take an additional 10 years now to close the pay gap to levels before the pandemic. It was worse and now it's gotten even <laughs> worse. But I also feel optimistic because I know as Amelia, you mentioned, I know that there's this unmissable opportunity uh, to um, make the most of diversity. How are we gonna do that? Well, think about intersectional issues like climate change. Uh, you know, how are we going to unlock the potential of diverse communities, individuals and organizations and systems to tackle the bigger problem, bigger than the pandemic, bigger than what we've ever seen, the climate emergency. Um, part of our work as Kite Insights, and we are a woman owned business, uh, is uh, with the Women's Forum, which is this big organization that brings together different business and other stakeholders to look at issues uh, on which women's leadership uh, and diversity and inclusion can make a, a, an outsized impact. And, and climate and um, women is one, one such area. Um, we know that through the research that we've done there, um, diversity can be crucial for a just transition. There's gonna be 63 million new jobs just through renewable energy alone. And we need everybody to learn the skills they need to have those jobs to achieve fulfilling lives. Um, ooh, sorry, uh, we also know that uh, diversity of all kinds of perspectives of lived experiences makes for more innovative organizations. There's a study of 7,000 companies that show that those with diverse uh, teams are more innovative. They have created better and newer products. Um, and we, we want to make sure that our future is equitable too. Uh, why leave uh, sections of society out of the, the shared value that we will create? Um, a, a BCG study finds that just in, including gender equality in entrepreneurship can add three to six uh, percent GDP. Um, so what does that mean? That means that we, as uh, as people who believe in diversity, who are diverse themselves, uh, we you know we use our resilience and our grit to drive this forward. But that's not enough. We also need institutions and systems to change. We we need regulatory and legal uh, measures across the world to support this. I, I find it absolutely ridiculous to suggest that, you know, you can have it all when the systems around you aren't changing. I think the private sector initiatives, public sector transformation, investment, all of that has to work hand in hand to, to really grasp this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Abri. I think that the fact that you mentioned being angry and hopeful at the same time, is a very, uh, a very correct way of looking at diversity because diversity is, in a way, the anomaly in the system. And anomaly in the system can represent a vulnerability, as you mentioned, so the place where the system is vulnerable or the place where the system can evolve. They can represent the opportunity for the system to evolve and progress for the best of all the system, so not only for the best of the anomalies. And so that's why anomalies and diversities are the place where you can either be angry or hopeful or be both at the same time, because they can be, they can represent both uh, consequences. So there is a lot, a lot on the table. And I will ask uh, Bill, if possible, to continue on the conversation. Thank you. Well, to, uh, to, me, to me, my diversity, that's uh, SBC America, Many people all over the world come to America, why? They escape from the poverty, the world. And then people from our world come to America, they have their special capabilities. And any people before coming to America, very poor, but they live for a long time, they preach why? Their opportunities. And then we see American that diversity of 
people all over the world, as in my country, Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh City, people come from all provinces. If you have special capability, come here, work, and make earning, buy a house, you will be rich in Ho Chi Minh City. So we see that any society openness, open to all the people. That society developed. And if you look back to Hanoi, Hanoi is the capital of Vietnam, but we say no end enter that market. Over there, no, just the local people over there. No one can come there to do business because they do not open the door to anybody. That no diverse. They don't diverse people from other province. So even the people over the world, whenever they come to Vietnam, they want to run business, they come to Ho Chi Minh City. They don't, don't come to Hanoi. That's the reason. And then my conclusion, diversity can help a country, a society, or company develop. As my firms, IBS and two, we do software for education, and we hide the we have the IT from the US, from European country, from Asian Singapore. Vietnam IT people are very smart, but cannot do on. Just the people all over the world they have their special capability that they can help that society, that country, that company develop. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, I think it's amazing how you started right away with I mean, people leaving places to go to, pl to the majority places. That's very interesting. Because if you think about, when we speak about diversity, we always say diversity and inclusion. But the word inclusion means homologation. Hmm? So the fact that minorities are in a way instinctively moving toward majorities to be included means we are losing most of our resources in this movement. We are losing most of our potential for progress and innovation, human innovation. So we are, that's, you can really see the waste happening while people fit in what gets out, what remains out of this fitting in. That's very interesting. And I'm very sorry that Adam hasn't arrived yet because um, he, he spoke to me about something that is very interesting for this conversation because it's a common trait that uh, allows us to be diverse and at the same time uh, be together. He speaks a lot about care. I think that care is a matter on which we all agree. Although we all have our specifics, our um, characteristics in caring, caring is a common trait of the human species. And it's what is uniting us around this table. And care is what allows diversity to still be specific while being included, to still express all its potential and at the same time find a common table, enlarge the table for everybody to sit there. So I, I guess sorry, I'm taking a few more minutes just to share what I think Adam would have said. And the amazing way he says it is, is a way in which after he talks, you really feel better. So that's the other point is when, when you find the common thread between diversity, within diverse people, what happens is that that common language, that shared threat, makes everybody feel better because we want to be alone. <laughs> we need to be alone. It's like it's, it's the key for our survival. So we can, when we cannot fit in or we, we don't feel like we're fitting in, the point is we feel weaker. And so it's, it's like we, we also contribute less. But that's not the point. The point is we feel weaker and we feel worse. So the, 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 the common trait of, of these anomalies is what can make us flourish, each one with his or her uh, specificity. And specificity, we'll get back to that at the end of the roundtable, because the point, I, see, I think it's a matter between complexity and specificity, what we're talking about. And, and finally, sorry, Bill, just again on what you said, you made me think about the fact that when there is a problem of discrimination, normally it's because there is a story that is being told, that is just one part of the story. We are listening to one part of the story, 
and there is a whole story that is not being told and that's why we are disc- some of us feel discriminated in some points of our life and that's very interesting to know because then probably when we get together with the majority we can try to enrich the story a larger story that so that we all find our place uh, to express ourselves and I'm I'm looking at Munir who's moving around with his his camera so <laughs> I'm not sure if he's ready for a second round but we have another 20 minutes so I think we have time now to to comment on what we heard from one another I think we we made, we made a very a first very rich puzzle about all the things we're talking about, how complex this matter is, how large and how small at the same time it can be, and uh, how present in the lives we all live every day. Um, and that's why probably we're so passionate about it. I don't know if Munir is somewhere in the room or... <laughs> and if you're, Munir, if you're ready and if you want to comment on what you heard and if there is any other key concept you would like to share with us. Yes, I don't know if you... But let's see if we can hear you. You're, yeah, I think the let's connection is bad. Yeah. A little bit connection problem. Let's see. Is it okay? So and so. It's going on and on, on and off. So we can do, we, I can start with uh, Amelia, if yeah. you feel ready, and then we wait until Munir has a better connection. Hmm? Yes, um, a little bit. I still feel uh, when we are talking about this majority, you know, um, when people are emigrating, for example, in my case, uh, um, when I was a mother of two, I decided to, my husband is Dutch, but not because he's Dutch. I, I moved to a country where I, I felt that it was possible for me and my children to have opportunities for the future. And, and to be uh, fully acknowledged with our um, full potential or our whole self. And yes, in this case, there is a miss on um, what he was expressing when he was with his own father, no? Uh, the tendency to move to a country where you can be more productive, more included, more valuable. But then at a certain point, yeah, um, how are you included? Is, are you seen just as a productive piece of the, the bustle or are you included in your entire culture? And this is when, yeah, the narrative of discrimination needs to be uh, understood by all parts involved about what are experiences and then what are the gaps created because then we have this big ex- a split on being productive and reproductive. And then this reproduction that is not only about women, this care, um, as uh, Ever was mentioning, the care has been minimized and undervalued. And now with COVID, we have seen that, well, we have the next wave or climate change is already exposing a lot of care to all our ecosystems, the living systems that have been broken. And we really need to transform this productivity, but as well, um, the problem of diversity, I think it's pointing out to the problem of including this expression, uh, the living systems that is impacting, that is the sustaining force, the life sustaining force beyond any system, whether it's social, economic, or, or whatever it takes. So it really needs to be uh, measured or seen, being perceived as a way to see, to create this new future. We are moving into a new future. And in this new future, we really need, in this special community of races, we really need to understand that we are entering in a perceiving the, this unknown. And in this unknown, we cannot do it if it's not together. And in this not together, it's not just saying, okay, who's the majority? I wouldn't agree that there is a majority. I would agree that there is a, a very narrow, a small decision make uh, part of it that's stopping the majority of humanity and population to be expressed and to be uh, self uh, uh, developed, no? And this is what we are calling about, uh, unleash this potential for the future of humankind. We are not talking in a small terms. It's really about the future of humankind. We are talking at a species issue. So yeah, and COVID is exposing this mirroring that uh, affecting the care system has affected the functioning of the economy and the most, um, perceived powerful structures. And now it's clear what's the most powerful structure. That's it's our care, but of course it's our own humanity. And humanity is not diverse. This is the common thread to all of us. 
It doesn't matter your nationality or your your gender. It doesn't matter. What we are common here is that we are all human. Our own humanity is the only thing that will make our prosper at the level of a species. And we need to start thinking at the level of a species. At the level of all species, I hope. Protect ourselves, but also those that we share the planet with. <laughs> exactly. To include all the... But yeah. Uh, since the, the problem is in this majority minority to, to move into this. But exactly, yes, absolutely, including even... Abri, if you want to continue, just feel free to continue. Oh, I just I just wanted to say that um, I, I it was a pleasure to meet everyone here. And I think that what I'm going to take away from this are your stories. And Bill, when you mentioned people's desire to take such strong personal sacrifice, and, and Munir, your, your father's desire to do that and their ability to do that. Um, those, I think, show a part of our, our experience as humans uh, that is so beautiful. And I think that there, there's a, a great deal of effort to be placed in telling positive stories um, about our ability to change, to move, to have resilience, to have grit, and and to include in those stories people who also feel left behind, people who've never seen a person of color or an immigrant in their lives be because of where they live, people who feel that their industry is going under and therefore lose their jobs in the Rust Belt in the U.S., um, and, you know, help, help them believe in a positive narrative, too, that ultimately diversity is a win-win. Um, it's not a lose-lose. Um, that's what I want to end on. And thank you for this conversation. It's good to know you're not alone. Huh? <laughs> I think that's the basis for us to feel safe and, and well. So Muni, are you back? Do you, can you? Uh, yes, I hope. Can you, can, can you hear me well? Yes. Yeah, so um, I really share what you're saying. And, and for, for me, there's um, also maybe two or three aspects to, to expand on it. Um, one is actually that there is a scientific research around that diversity. Uh, when you look at the limbic system of the brain, it's actually not something which comes natural to us. So if you look at, at the past time, so when, when, um, when we're at the time of dinosaurs and so on, when somebody was diverse, we looked at him as more as an, uh, as an enemy. So diversity is something we, we need to, if we have not grown up with, as, as some of you mentioned, is something we, we need to learn. And uh, what I like to say is that Often, in, if you look at companies, um, if you look at their product and services, they claim themselves to be global and distribute everywhere. But what is an important key point is that we should do more sort of co-creation, looking at who is our customers from a business perspective and think about, well, my customers are diverse, so shouldn't I be as well? And the way how to do that is then also to look at your wealth of employees you have around. And if you do not have that diversity, you can always engage with the NGO sector, which help you to do co-creation. To give a very concrete example, if you look at the financial sector who does a lot in terms of inclusion, inclusion, uh, unbanked people, and so on, uh, sustainability, there is a big aspect. Often I say, if you look at the Islamic finance world, I mean, 1.4 billion Muslim population, they are left out. They have a different financial system, but often it's not too different. It's just an aspect of really getting into it and think about, okay, what is the other system? What can I do in the already in the product design, service design, totally different? How can I include that? And, and this is a, a different thinking we need to we need to embrace and put into our companies when we are working in there and and think about that maybe yeah just one one aspect to share i think there are many more you could share so let's see if we have time thank you munir and sorry just realized i didn't introduce bill when i when i I called him. So Bill Nguyen is the founder and chief executive officer of the ABS Institute. So uh, Bill, how do you react to what you heard today? 
uh, I'm so happy to uh, have uh, meeting with all of you and to my opinion, diversity that can push a country, a society, a community developed and anybody in that society happy that we will be happy. No poverty, no properties, everybody happy. That's my opinion. Thank you. Okay, you think you're done. We have 10 minutes and I think you're, we are making it a bit too easy. Like, uh, yeah, okay, so we all agree that diversity is needed, that is a good thing, that it produces well-being and everybody produces more and better and flourish. So why is it not happening? And what can each one of you concretely do tomorrow for this to happen? A uh, quick round. And we can start with uh, Amelia, who I'm sure has. Yeah, well, in my case, and actually this is happening, the mission is always, for example, when engaging the global agenda of the SDG5, how can one company make this maximization to a global scale? No? Well, there is a mission from the outside that is uh, for the company needs to understand the dimension of the problem. So normally for the private sector, it needs to come to the a CEO perspective, okay, to really transform the market. So to really understand, uh, as, as, um, uh, he was mentioning, um, uh, that you need to reflect the markets of today. You need to reflect the societies of today. But how do you include this? So in our case, it starts with a clear narrative of the financial case, of the sustainability case, and of the human rights case. And then, this is, uh, there are many principles of operation, but really the leadership needs to take this in perspective to understand what is the vision you are talking about, how you internalize uh, this a strategic approach that follows a vision. You really need to look at the future as well, and you really need to acknowledge that there is something missing. So to, to not be judgmental towards yourself that you are having a gap, so that helps as well the narrative for stakeholders who are, we are consultants or advisors or the UN or uh, any civil society, any NGO, exactly at, as he was mentioning, the co-creative side of it. So it's a very strategic approach to a humankind issue. And so in this case, uh, to, the, to the call to the private sector and especially also ministries of economy, because to not underestimate the gender policies and economic policies as well, maternity protection, pay equity, all employment and labor offices, uh, uh, policies that needs to really come together and co-create together. So private sector on its own is not going to make it. The CEO really needs to make a compliance issue with ESG governance is about good governance. And then the diversity and inclusion leaders have also a next mission that this is what we are funding in our, in our work. They really need to escalate the conversation beyond having a portfolio of diversity and inclusion initiatives into incorporating this, in our case, gender, um, gender, uh, strategies from the business strategy perspective. So as the colleague was mentioning, you really need to look at your business and to become that market. You really need to become that market. So in our perspective, for example, the shift we are seeing is that instead of seeing uh, uh, investing in gender matters of International Women's Day or having a speaker, companies are really analyzing now how our markets are operating. So from an internal perspective, our talent management, HR policies, everything that is internal to perceive women not only as a problem and a small issue, but it's half of your talent, is half of your employees. When you look at your markets, is half of your consumers. And in some markets, is the totality of your consuming. Uh, and then expanding into the supply chain that today has been broken. So then to really make inclusive procurement, a, a, big, a global gender response like Unilever, for example, I don't want to do marketing, I'm not working for them, but it's an example of what a company is capable to do, to an investment of a two billion a strategy to reduce the wage gap as a strategy not for Unilever, in order to reconstruct the market that had been broken. So the market-oriented approach to the SDGs in this case, I think it's a momentum to see this future, and it needs to be considered from these three angles, the business case, the sustainability case, and the human rights case. 
mm. to mainstream all of these strategies. I knew you had some ideas. <laughs> so, the, yeah, the point is we are speaking about something very complex. It could be seen as a complex problem or as a complex opportunity, but anyhow, it's complex. So you, you, you can't address just one thing at a time. You have to see the whole picture. And um, so, Bill, could you, could you comment on this? Uh, diversity that can help a society develop. Yeah, it's, a, it's an engine. It's a potential engine, yeah. And, uh, and Munir, I know you already started speaking about uh, solutions. So I want you to continue on, uh, on this. Yes, yes, I, I agree with, with Amelia very much. I mean, at the end, it is about be it the NGO, be it, be it personally, but also as a company, to recognize we have a problem. We are not yet there in, in, in many ways. I mean, we, can, we don't need to tackle the overall diversity really in our, all aspects, but tackle one and then treat it like you would treat a business problem, put real numbers behind it. Some scientists say put 30% as a, as a starting point of, of, of that and then define real consequences in, in your company. Um, and I think important is there to also say, it's, we need to put ambition uh, behind it, we need to treat it, but also recognizing as a problem, also if we're failing and not to reach it, that is often a problem. Companies sometimes define goals where they know we ha if we wanna go public with it, which, which makes it accountable and we are failing, then, you know, what does it mean? But at the effect, it is now also when you look at the new generation workforce or diverse generation we are bringing in, I mean, it, it's something in terms of the DNA. We need to fail, we need to learn from it, we need to improve, we need to do small cases, you know, like in many companies I see, um, women back to work programs which with educational around where you take a one concrete case you have working groups in your companies and say okay let's tackle that how can we put something in, in into work how can we learn from from the others and i think there we would uh, we would improve and naturally i agree on a larger scale we need more and maybe one example just to to close i read about the iso 37000 which is sort of it's called governance of organizations where 56 countries have been working on it and it is sort of an overarching uh, iso norm and uh, many say that that will help a lot to push the business because it makes the leaders accountable also in 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 aspects like human rights so we'll hand over back to also the others too. Yeah. Human rights, okay. This is getting bigger. <laughs> yeah. So thank you so much, Munir. And um, I think we all agree that there is something to learn here, something to understand. We all agree that there is a biological reason why this is so difficult. It's not just by some evil intention for it to be difficult. It's based on, our, on the way our brain reacts to what is different from us. Uh, so, Ebru, the floor to you to close the conference. Uh, uh, I hand over to you the role of closing and. Um, oh wow! Okay. The, the conference. Uh, thank you, Ricardo. I mean, I think what I heard from ev every one of you today is um, that diversity cannot be solved in ex abstraction. There, it's everything is connected, and it is everyone's business. Uh, I think that would be my summary. So when when we recognize those connections, lean in on on them and make sure that everyone in an organization in, in a system sees it as their work, just as much as the diversity officer's job, just as much as the migrant person's advocacy <laughs> uh, point, we will we will get there much faster. So we need a new narrative. For diversity and we have to invest in it concretely everywhere in the world mm -hmm. okay thank you this is bad it's been very very interesting and uh thanks for the first step of our connection now we all go and uh visit each other soon as yes. soon as possible it's been a pleasure i have to say thank you. You. <laughs> it's my pleasure to meet all of you thank you <laughs>
Likewise. <laughs> let's stay in touch. Yes. Yeah. Let's in touch. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.